of democracy in the Middle East or the so-called Arab Spring. And Dr. Madhu, before we had our first uh, commercial break, you promised that you would give us the, uh, some information in reference to the implication of uh, some, of the, uh, some of these countries that have gone uh, democratic uh, during the so-called Arab Spring. First of all, let's, let's uh, take Tunisia. Last year in October, you know, after the elections, the Islamic Party of uh, Monchef Mazuki you know, won the elections. And uh, the fear of most people in Tunisia was that they're going to establish a theocratic state, mm -hmm. you know, ruled according to the Koran. But, you know, the president has come out and said, no, you know, we are going to leave things the way they were. Tunisia is a secular state and we're going to run a secular state. You know, we don't want to chase away tourists because mm -hmm. the tourists have already started, you know, getting afraid if they're mm -hmm. going to ban people from swimming on the beaches mm -hmm. and you know it. Mm -hmm. Christians have already gotten scared, you know, if they're going to lose, you know, their liquor licenses and mm -hmm. not lose. But the government has said, no, we're not going to do all that in the interest of our economy mm -hmm. because if we chase tourists out, the economy will go down and there'll be nobody, nothing to govern. Mm -hmm. So they're sensible enough to understand that for them to survive and run the country efficiently, they have to run it as a secular state. Mm -hmm. You know, introducing an Islamic state will be counterproductive to the economy. Mm -hmm. Now in Egypt, an Islamist party also won, you know, under Mohammed Morsi, mm -hmm. who is an American educated PhD holder. <clears throat> now Morsi has distanced himself from this, you know, from the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, he resigned his membership after he became president. Mm -hmm. Saying, "Well, I'm going to be president of everybody, you know, Christians and Muslims and women, mm -hmm. and you know it." Mm -hmm. Now, prior to his election, you know, the Constitutional Court that was appointed by Mubarak, you know, mm -hmm. dissolved mm -hmm. Parliament that was filled with members of Mohammed Morsi's party. Mm -hmm. Now, the army also came and subscribed, you know, subscribed his powers, mm -hmm. saying, well, you know, you can be president, but we don't want you to mess around with foreign policy mm -hmm. or defense policy. We'll, we'll keep that to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now, when Morsi came in, the first thing he did was, you know, call parliament back into session for a few minutes just to challenge the army. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that happened. Right now, he is involved in a tussle with the army for power. Now, people will say, well, the army is trying to grab power and keep power. Mm -hmm and keep Morsi out of power. What I see is this. The army is trying to play the same role the army plays in Turkey's elections. Mm -hmm. Because since Kamel Atatürk, who was really, they call him the founder of modern Turkey, mm -hmm. decreed that Turkey must be a secular state mm -hmm. and that the army should be the guarantor of that secular state, the army already always played a strong role in the political affairs of Turkey. Mm -hmm. So I suppose the SCAF, that's the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces in Egypt, mm -hmm. under General Tantawe, wants to play that similar role, to be a guarantor in Egypt. of secularism mm -hmm. in Egypt, to make sure Mohammed Morsi doesn't move the country into a theocratic state, mm -hmm. you know, run by the Muslim Brotherhood. I think that's what they're trying to play, to make sure, you know, he's the president of everybody. Because if Egypt becomes an Islamic republic, Tourism is going to dry up. The economy is going to go down. Christians already started getting afraid they will leave the country. So he wants to, the scarf wants to make sure the army, that Morsi runs Egypt as a secular state. And you should remember, Morsi's election is historic, not just because it's the first really free democratic election in Egyptian history, but it's the first time a civilian, a real civilian has, run Egypt since 1952. Mm -hmm. Nasser was, mm -hmm. uh, was a soldier. Sadat was a soldier. Mubarak was a soldier. Okay. So the three rulers of Egypt have been soldiers. So this is the first time you have a real civilian. But the army wants to make sure that country remains a secular state. <clears throat> Moreover, there's a big threat, economic threat to the army. The Egyptian army receives billions of dollars from the United States government every year. And the army understands that if Egypt was to move towards being an Islamic Republic, <laughs> that money is going to go. It will dry up. That's exactly one of the reasons why they feel threatened by any untoward you know, move towards 
an Islamic Republic. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. has made it clear, you know, Ms. Clinton visited a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. you know, that they want Morsi to be the president of everybody and guarantee equal rights for Christians and women. That was clear. So the army in Egypt wants to play that same role that the Turkish army plays. Mm -hmm. Turkey is run by an Islamist party under, you know, uh, uh, Erdogan. Mm -hmm. But Erdogan understands he can move, you know, you too really far. Without the army. Exactly, and the army is going to stop him if he moves too much to become an Islamic party. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's the same role the armed forces in Egypt is trying to play. Now in Libya, the elections that were just held, the, the a liberal party won under Mahmoud Jibril, who is currently the prime minister. Mm -hmm. The Libyan election is unique in a way because the Islamists did not have any role to play. Mm -hmm. The Libyans rejected the Islamic parties, not because they don't like them, but because the Islamic parties did not play any role. Mm -hmm. 